Hello and welcome back to Let's Read Ruby Before the Dawn. I am your host, Raymond McNeil of Celtic Phoenix Productions, and joining me today, as always, is the erstwhile Molly Rhyme Master. I'm tired. I, I, we don't really want to, we want to do this, but you also don't really want to do this. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a labor of, um, misguided love? I don't know what you would call it. Hello, uh, the everyone. other Molly is in chat. Yes, Molly, too. You know, I've actually worked a couple of places, and, like, both of the janitor jobs I did, there was always someone with the same name as me. And so, basically, we just numbered them based on uh, when they were hired. When I was in um, Army ROTC at school, for some reason, like, half the men were named Patrick. Yeah, that adds up. No, it doesn't. I don't know why that I, is. That's I should... I should I should point out that like most of of the kids at my school come from upstate New York or Massachusetts. So Yeah, and Floof, I uh it, you might want to look it up. I think there's fan art of that. Coco as the uh the Cocoa Puff cereal bird. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that exists. I don't think girlfriends in chat yet, so I can't do girlfriend in chat. But um, I got I got uh, another pal of mine in chat, so give him a little shout out. I don't know what he wants to be called, but I was gonna call him by his screen name. So hi, Cyan. It's good good to have you here if you are here. Let's see, I see Molly is presumably in her Corey Wong costume Corey. for the evening. Who's Corey Wong? Uh, let me look that up. Is that why you're still here reading this? I uh, love your fans so much. You'll suffer. Yeah, yeah, no. I, we're reading this because I need to be appraised of Ruby lore. I'm tempted to yeah. read... What? 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 He, he's a guitarist, and he seems to like wearing striped sweaters. Ah, let me see. The, uh... I, I'm tempted to read that lore book that they released, but, like... Uh... <laughs> why did they release a fairy tale book? lore but this is like the show we don't want lore we just want no no story. lore just story it's like that dog that the frisbee you want a pet velvet like, soft fluffy ears lore yes. is good but i feel like they've established enough to work with we don't need more of it yeah so we're gonna see how much we can get through today it is more than likely we will actually be able to push through to the epilogue we have 42 pages left in the book that would probably be longer than we've ever gone before, but you know what? For you guys, we'll give it a good old try. Um, if we're here till 8 p.m., we're here till 8 p.m. Yes. but And knowing yeah. this book, it's going to end just as abruptly as the last one. I... Like, like, if I don't you, know what I'm doing. If you thought that Resident Evil Code Veronica's novelization ended abruptly, you ain't seen nothing to the writer of these books. <laughs> Oh, did you read ahead? No, 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 no. The last book, uh, the last book, uh, 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 after the fall, um, ended super friggin' abruptly, it, like, like really abruptly. It, it felt really out of place. I don't know how to describe it. Oh no! Did my tassel fall off? Oh, oh, oh! Thank God. Yeah, uh, it fell off only an inch. Good. I can, I can just put it back on. My little, my little tassels. My important little tassels are so cute. Anime is art. Why are you re why are you watching us do this at six thirty in the morning so that I could just make a bad Australian accent for two and a half hours? That is some dedication. To be fair, that is a very high entertainment factor. All right, we'll get here. All right, time to time to pull up the uh, the chart. Ah, uh, yes, the chart. The chart. Next time, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll actually get something to put that on screen with. So everyone knows the accents you have to put on. Okay, I think the tassel's fixed. Ladies and gents, let's get into this. How many chapters does this game have? Uh, 22. 
All right, here we go. An explosion shook the chamber. Oh, wait. I'm oh, sorry. I forgot to say. Last time, uh, the bad guys made their attack and everyone split up to go fight them. Yes. Okay. Anyway. An explosion shook the chamber where Sun uh, waited, followed by a series of smaller explosions like gunshots. The mine rumbled around Sun in the vacuums he had freed. Then stones fell from the ceiling and clouds of dust filled the air. What was that? What was that? I guess <laughs> someone asked. That would be Velvet and Octavia, Sun said briefly. For a moment, he wondered whether he should go after them. But while Velvet and Octavia no doubt needed, uh, needed him, these people, the drain people of Vacuo, needed him more. They needed not find their way out of the labyrinth of the caves without him. If there was even still a way out. Even there was a Hold on, I got this. I got this. Should we check on them? Someone said from a bed. Eh, the Dunful, a gruff voice replied. Son and the others turned and saw Bertilek Celadon. Oh, this is Bertilek. Eh, they're, they're done for, a gruff voice replied. Son and the others turned around and saw Bertilek Celadon sitting upright and throwing off a uh, thin blanket that covered him. Soon he swung his legs around and hopped to his feet. If they're up against Carmine, they're more than likely on the wrong end of that blast. A shame, though. I always liked that bunny girl. Son grabbed Ryu Bang and Jingu Bang. He set his jaw and stalked towards Bertilek. How long have you been awake? He couldn't be too careful with this guy. Long enough, Bertilak, said Bertilak. Rebuilding my strength. Uh, rebuilding my strength. Jill took a lot out of me. My fault for letting her touch me. And for trusting Carmen. He laughed, as if he had nothing at stake at all right now. Pro tip. The prettier the face, the uglier the person. Then you must be a beautiful person deep inside, Sun said. Way deep. I've been lying here wondering when you were going to free me and invite me to your little party. I'm just an innocent victim here. You're far from innocent, Sun said, frowning. In fact, you're probably one of the, uh, the only person in this room who deserves to be drained like that. Believe me, no one deserves that, Bertilek said. I, I know that we're 19 chapters in and I still don't really know who Bertilek is. He was in the first book, so he got a lot more focus there. But he's just sort of like a okay. general asshole. Think Cardin. Obligatory asshole character. Yeah, yeah. Th think kind of like Cardin a little bit, but a little less pompous. He's much more like, much more subdued than Cardin. Uh, My favorite is when there's a character who's just super mean to someone for no reason other than for there to be some sort of tension. Oh, no, I do it all the time just for fun. It's great. You know, it makes me lots of friends. I get to be the Sundari in a lot of their stories. Um, I don't feel... Uh, I don't like feeling powerless, and neither would you. He met Sun's eyes, and Sun wasn't sure how to read his gaze until he continued speaking. Put those toys away, boy. I don't mean to fight you. And you better hurry if you want to save your friends. Sun held on to his weapons, anyway. He didn't believe those words, especially not when they were coming from a kidnapper, a mercenary who had gone back on his huntsman oath and everything he had trained for. Still, he had to ask... You're helping us? Brief pause here. There's a Huntsman Oath. Have we... Did, could, could we please get, a, like, a transcript of what that oath is? Sort of like the Hippocratic Oath? You hold know? on, hold on. Anime is art is right. We've had two books in Vacuum with not one mention of their maiden. Because why would we use our world building for anything when we could just forget it exists? Exactly. Like, I don't understand, like... I, what 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 do huntsmen like? What's the oath a huntsman takes? Because they're mercenaries. I will make sure to die before I turn forty. <laughs> yeah, maybe he. Yeah, he just he betrayed it because he's lived so long. Um. Damn. She can't perch on my shoulder very well. Do do do. I didn't say that, but let's just say I'd like Carmine uh, to see Carmine again. Repay what I owe her. Sun didn't think Bertilek was talking about settling a, uh, a settling of loan money. No dip, Sherlock. Uh, when they were strong enough to move, Sun let the, uh, led the group of 50 vacuums, plus Bertilek, back through the, into the place where the tunnel branched, off in four directions. The mine rumbled and groaned around them, in constant danger of caving in. That way, Bertilek declared, pointing in one direction with confidence. Sun eyed the wicked mace hanging from the man's belt, and tried to remember that he wasn't an enemy. Uh, or not one worth dealing with right now, at least. Yeah, he basically is just, you know, Cardin again. He has a mace, too. 
Hold on, hold on. Floof asked about the Weiss plush. Does Floof not know Tiny Weiss? So, Floof, you don't know Tiny this Weiss. This is so. This is Tiny Weiss. Uh, I've had her since I was, I want to say seventeen. Um, she was a gift from an internet friend of mine who turned out to be a groomer and got me tooed by his friend group one month after sending me a letter about what a terrible person I was. Anyway, so uh, Tiny Weiss <laughs> is wearing a military uniform because she wants to be just like her big sister. Uh, and I gave her little shoes that I you found hold in her up. arcade you, you, she, in Six she's Flags. In Six Flags, New England. You, you, um, you've got to hold her up. You, you can't see her. Oh, oh, sorry. So she has these little shoes. I got them at Six Flags, New England in an arcade. She's really representative of, of the journeys I've made. Uh, and uh, she's just, she's uh, nice to have around. And she's got little sister Tiny Mar uh, Mini Marn in the background there, I think. Oh, yeah, Mini Marn is in the background. She's taking a nap, so I'm not going to bother her. Okay, that's fine. Okay, here we go. Where were we? Um, Burlock's tunnel took them to a dead end, though. The tunnel had completely collapsed here, and Sun hoped it hadn't been a mistake let, uh, th to let Burlock take the lead. What would his team think if they could see him now? Velvet! Sun called. The ceiling trembled. What if his friends were under this mess? Shh, Burlock said. Shh, Burlock said. Don't give away our location. I'm not interested in joining this grave. The other vacuums lagged behind, but, they, um, but at least they were moving, and their slower pace allowed them to notice details that Sun had missed. One of them picked something up and asked, Does this look familiar? It was a dagger with a wavy blade. Octavia? Sun called. Octavia? Sun called, looking around the passageway. He heard a groan uh, close to the cave-in. A boot stuck out of the rocks, still attached to a foot and a leg, but it belonged to a man, not to Octavia or Velvet. Sun started digging away. This is going to take forever. I mean, they do, don't don't assume his gender. Uh, the other hand uh, began lifting the rocks off the mound with him. The people he had just rescued, some of them barely able to stand on their feet, were helping him dig uh, dig out someone they didn't even know. Sun smiled and they kept working. This felt like a different kind of teamwork. After thirty minutes of hard labor, the group uncovered a basic human decency is a different type of teamwork. The group uncovered a body, an unconscious, sturdy-looking man who was part of the Crown's group, judging by the scorched armband on his arm. Then they found a second body under him, sheltered from most of the rocks. This person was also alive, and Sun soon recognized Octavia Ember. She opened her eyes and tried uh, to move. Octavia. Oh. <laughs> ow, but... <laughs> I don't know how to do a deep ow, so... Oh, she said. Deeper. Then she bolted up, grimacing, and said, and she froze. Get out for a sec. Did you did you read your line? Yeah, you you, you froze. You froze. Uh, we we waited for you. We waited for you. Go ahead and say it. Oh, oh okay. Is, am I at Velvet, or is yeah, she Velvet. standing right there? Velvet. Velvet? She wasn't with you? Sun asked, helping her to her feet and trying not to panic. She was standing right here, right there. Octavia pointed in Bertilek's direction. The huntsman was crouched over a uh, hand sticking out of the rock pile, holding it, uh, holding a sigh. Bertilek grabbed the sigh triumphantly. Oh, that's right. Aha! There you are, yeah. Red! He tucked the sigh into his belt and drew his mace, bringing it over his head. This is what you get for stabbing me in the back. Stop! Sun closed his eyes and one of his clones flashed into existence besides Bertilak, grabbing the mace before he could bring it down uh, on the buried body in front of him. Cute trick. Bertilak shook the mace free and uh, faced off against Sun's clone. Don't cross me, kid. This isn't Carmine. Uh, Octavia told him. She was standing over there during the explosion. She was closest to the avalanche. The spot was several... Oh, okay. The spot was several steps yeah. away from the body. Yeah. Bertilak sighed. Even with extra aura, Carmen couldn't have survived that, he said. Or if she did, she must be out of there by now. Maybe he wouldn't get his revenge after all. Sun raced across the room and started digging faster to get to Velvet. Everyone else pitched in uh, to uncover her, quickly but gently. Help us! He shouted to Bertilak. Bertilak grinned. You missed a spot. He put his mace on his belt and uh, eased himself back into uh, on a large boulder. Ah. Uh. 
When they finally freed Velvet, Sun didn't uh, like how fragile and still she was. With all the care he could manage, he reached down and lifted her out. You're not supposed to move her. Something could be broken, Octavia said. She's fine, Sun said. She's going to be fine. He just kept telling himself that. He removed her camera from its holster uh, on its back and laid her down gent uh, flat, gently on a flat surface. Come on, Velvet, he said. If you're hurt, your team is going to kill me. Always worried about yourself. A tiny voice said the Velvet, uh, said, Velvet smiled. Oh, I just had the image. Tiny Velvet. Oh, thank the gods! <laughs> Someone said from the crowd. <laughs> Sun sprawled, uh, sprawled next to her. Velvet, you okay? She opened her eyes and, uh, wider and spoke more clearly. <laughs> uh, you might want to say that again. You, you, you sputtered. Yeah, okay. Let me fix that. Hotspot on. Hotspot on. Uh, so it will take a second. Because I'm going to disconnect and reconnect. But I don't want us to keep... Yeah, Sun, Sun went too hard on her. She needs to lay out a little bit. Sun X Velvet is a good ship. It's a, it's a solid ship. Very wholesome. That is. Seeing if Pat looks good with this outfit. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Alright, so give that line a read again. Alright, here we go. Anyone got the number of that Elysian pallet? That was a beacon, Sunset Crestfallen. Velvet's brain must have been all scrambled from the explosion. I know. I'm just messing with you. She said, struggling to sit up. Now when someone says it hit me like a ton of bricks, I know exactly how that feels. That's that's kind of lame that they, like, pretend she's hurt and then she isn't. I, I mean... I was ready for drama. Velvet's kind of a dick. I like that. <laughs> she looked around at all the gathered people, the ones son, son had freed. Oh, good. You're all safe. Son smiled. Always worried about other people first, he said. But I'm not sure I'd call us safe. This place is um, is going to come down at any moment. I'm sorry, that's all my fault. But I would explain what had happened in the fight against Carmine and Jill, plus their last-ditch effort to stop them. Did it work? She oh, this is Velvet still. Oh, did it work? She asked Octavia. Octavia shook her head. I think we got Carmine, but just before everything came down on our heads, Jill flew backward out of the cave. Carmine's telekinesis, Velvet said. She used it to save her friend at the last second. Carmine was always a uh, Carmine always had a soft spot for the Asturias twins, Bertolek explained. She used to call Jill Queenie in school. She bought into their whole uh, royalty thing big time. I think she just wanted to get as far away from the uh get as far away from the uh, Atlesian way of life as possible. He laughed. Ironic that she left Atlas so she wouldn't be pressured into joining their militia, but she here she is, part of another dictator's army. What about you? Sun asked. Why do you see in them? Bertolak was unashamed. I bought into the promise of being rich and helping rule a kingdom. I don't care if they're really the heirs to the throne or whatever nonsense. If you have the power to take something, then, what, then that's all you... Uh, and that's all the birthright you need. Jax and Jill have their own power. Uh, have their, have a lot of power. He scowled. Some of it even came from me. Uh, I mean, I guess Bertolak has been consistently a really good character just because he's... He, he's unabashedly a greedy bastard. It's great. Also, I need to lower this freaking blind because I'm going blind. Oh my god. By the way, how's volume in the meantime? Are we both good? Um, I don't think we've had any complaints. Hey, chat, how have we, how have we been sounding, huh? How's my driving? How's my driving, chat? Ah, there, is that better? Okay, now 
icon is light. One of my professors refers to the live stream as chat. He'll just be like, the questions in chat, like, how are we doing today, chat? It's really interesting because it's an engineering dynamics class. You literally said, all right, if if you can't hear the problem, put F in chat since you all like doing that anyway. <laughs> all right, here we go. Someone pressed him for more. Uh, does it bother you they, uh, they thought you were more useful as a battery than in a battle, he asked? Bertilak shrugged. It's a paycheck. <laughs> I respect this man's grift. It's great. Uh, I hope I never need money that bad, Sunset stepping away from him. Bertilak turned and stalked off. See you around. Sun looked at Velvet, Octavia, and the others. I think that's the only way out, so now we're going to have to follow him, and it's going to be all awkward. Velvet was quiet on their way out of the underground base. Don't feel bad, Sun said. It was too much for any one person, maybe even for an army of people. I know, Velvet said. I mean, it was a good... Sun stopped. Y you know? I'm not beating myself up and losing jail. Velvet said. I'm thinking. Thinking about what? Velvet smiled. A plan. <laughs> when they emerged, they found... You see, I'm excited for this, because every time Ruby tries to do a plan, it's, it's like the most second-grade shit I've ever seen in my life. Remember when they stole an airship in Volume 6? Ah, uh, that was a plan. Fucking terrible plan. Uh, when they emerged, they found Bertilak standing, uh, standing still, taking a deep, appreciative breaths. Fresh air, he muttered. Velvet ignored him and headed directly for a box on the ground that seemed to be wired into a, the mining rig. I thought so, she said. It's a transmitter. For what? Sun asked. Octavia gasped. Oh, that's right. We detected an encrypted CCT signal and figured the crown had turned it into a pirate signal station. Perfect. Velvet said, hands on her hips. Just what we need. The call for help? Octavia asked. Exactly, but I can't unlock the station without a password. Sun looked closer at the box. Can't you hack it? <clears throat> I'm really better at building and wiring things. Velvet said. I know how to configure the settings on the relay station because I recently had a chance to read through the service manual. And you remember everything, Sun asked. Velvet's right ear twitched. See you again. Oh yeah, photographic memory. Bertilak strolled over. Not that I was eavesdropping or have any desire to help you, but Malik. What's that supposed to mean, Sun asked. That's the password. I told you. I heard everything while I was down there. It's the name of... Oh, it's name of the... Uh... Malik the Sanderer, first... Or really, Malik the Sanderer, first king of Vakio. Velvet said. I remember now. Velvet tapped away at the little keyboard, pausing to read the screen, her brow... Uh, pausing to read the screen, her brow furrowed. Bertilak suddenly bellowed. All right, Red, where are you? Where are you going? Octavia called. We got Carmine for sure, and the city's the other way. There's no way she went down that easily. And if she's not, um, and she's not going uh, to the city. When things get rough, Carmine cuts her losses and runs. I'm going to find her. See how she likes being hunted by the best huntsman in Vacuo. Headmaster Theodore, son asked? No, Bertilak Celadon. He climbed out of his sand pit surrounding the, the tower and disappeared over the ridge. Almost done. Velvet's ears drooped as she swiped, uh, wiped sweat from both her face and her arm. Who are you going to call anyway? Sun said. Everyone. Velvet looked up. You gave me the idea. All those people you rescued. She nodded uh, to the people who huddled in the entrance to the cave. That we rescued? Sun corrected her. No. You're the, only, you're the one who fought to find them all along. No one else cared. And then they all helped you rescue me. I might be... She swallowed. Still buried in there, if not for all of them. We need that kind of help if we're going to defeat Jackson Jill. We aren't going to win this with strength, but with numbers. And how accepting of a new monarchy will people be if the crown attacks ordinary people? 
you're gonna have a hard time convincing the people of Vacuo to rise up and do something to save themselves, Sun said. Hold on, hold on. They should have been arrested for that plan, but actually facing consequences of their actions is something the heroes can avoid easily, unlike Pyrrha and, and Eros. <laughs> Sun said. I agree. Velvet held up her scroll, which was wired into the terminal. That's why you're going to do it. Sun's mouth fell open. All right, all right. Already one chapter down. Also, I forgot the music. Let me put that on. Ah. You know, I know I don't always read Velvet lines perfectly, but honestly, some stuff just flows better with, with the dialect. So. Yeah. Yeah, this this book is actually really doing bananas justice. Like that's one of the few it things really that's actually getting right. Um, Whoa, know. shit! You asked me. Yeah, Carmine's alive. Yeah, no shit. Of course, Carmine's probably alive. What was it that Bertolac? I, I was confused there a little bit. What is it that Bertolac saw? I, I guess he just doesn't assume she's buried under those rocks. I guess that's it. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. That was how many? That was seven pages. Let's see. How long is this one? Chapter 20? I mean, the next chapter must be like 80. Oh, uh, there was a, a shooting near here. Um, shots fired, it says. Uh, which happens about once every three days. So. So this is oof. Yeah, he's upstate New York. It's, this is what? So that's twenty nine. It's this is twelve pages, but there's there's trade offs. So we're fine. No, hold on. Ryan doesn't get it. Ryan does. A woke ship does not mean a crack ship. A woke ship means that nobody's really considered it, but it would be amazing. Yeah. When you just throw two random characters who hate each other together, that's not woke. Or who probably would hate each other. Again, we don't know exactly how that dynamic would work out with James and Adam. It'd be an interesting one to explore, but I don't know if we'd ever have like the opportunity. Huh. Whoops, shootings. Must be Sunday. Alright, well, Molly, you're up. Let's see, there was a shooting... Today, yesterday, the 17th, the 14th. Jesus Christ. It, there's always a black SUV involved, too, which makes me worry that it's the same person. Oh, this oh. one was a black BMW. Ooh, they upgraded. All right. Is CJ Black freezer burn is my woke ship? It's not woke if it's popular. Yeah. Uh, do you guys think that whenever they get to Vacuo in the show, they'll uh, reference any of the events in these books? Would you prefer that? I mean, I doubt they will. Um, I think they'll they'll mention certain things from like Coco and Velvet and all that such. I think they'll make like offhanded remarks, but I don't think anything of substance will be mentioned. Um, and I, I actually I prefer if something of something su substance were mentioned. I prefer continuity over just ignoring things. I really get annoyed by Halo with how much the books get ignored. And then people got pissy at Halo 4 because it actually started referencing the books pretty deeply and in actually pretty cool ways. But, like, admittedly, Halo 4 handled some things pretty poorly. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but... I really get annoyed when people are like, don't mention the books. No, no. This is a cohesive universe, guys. You can have things that intertwine. You get people Actually, interested only... in other media by introducing it in new media. The only expanded universe book that, that really matters is the, the epic of uh, the Fallout Equestria series that was published into real hardcover books for some reason. Um, Fall, Fallout Equestria? As in, like, yeah, do you, do you not franchise? know about that? It's some like it's some like gigantic My Little Pony Fallout fan fiction, and it's like you could buy like binded hardcover copies legally. Yeah. 
How does that even work? That's like two IPs getting... Don't just... know. <laughs> well, okay then. Well, that's fun, I guess. <laughs> On today's episode of Weird Things That Molly Knows. Oh, all right. I'll take your word for it. Um, okay, so, uh, you're up. All right. Coco stood her ground and deflected Yatsuhashi's sword with her purse, gritting her teeth as if the force of his blow traveled through her arm. If Yatsuhashi was bluffing about being compromised by Jack, he was doing such a good job, he, he was even fooling her. Coco stepped aside neat, neatly as he brought his sword smashing down into the spot where she'd be standing aside. She swung her purse around and around, slamming into his arms. She held back just a tiny bit, and yet somehow that seemed to piss him off. Yatsuhashi swirled around, his blade scooping sand in her face. No one likes sand in their face, but Koko's sunglasses protecting her from being temporarily blinded. She spat the sand out of her mouth and grinned. We're gonna have to do more training after this. You're rusty, she called. Her mind wandered for a moment to, know to how Velvet Sun and Octavia were handling their mission. Coco didn't know what Jill was capable of in a fight, but Carmine was a handful all, all on her own. Her train of thought was cut off when Yatsuhashi rushed at her. She dashed towards him, dropped to the ground, and slipped between his legs. Then she rolled to her feet, turned around, and kicked him in the back. Yasuhashi went flying into another crown soldier who was locked in battle with Neptune. Hey, I had him! Neptune whined. Well. Neptune whined. Sorry, Coco said. Then she winced as Yasuhashi knocked Neptune over and faced her again. Koko switched her purse to a gun and planted herself. She and Yatsuhashi had practiced enough together for her to know how much she could handle. Yatsuhashi was almost in Koko's face before she fired her gun. Focus, Koko, she told herself. He held up his sword and blocked the bullets. Koko stopped firing, not wanting to hit anyone on her side with friendly fire. Yatsuhashi knelt and held his sword point down. Eyes <laughs> closed while he focused. Koko braced for, for what she knew was coming next. In a fluid motion, Yatsuhashi leaped left left bringing his sword around and around he spun with it like a top using the sword's weight in front of him as his momentum to slingshot him towards coco and bring his sword around for one final powerful blow like it's kind of Beyblade. Think about the dynamics of that it's the levi it's the levi even i know that reference isn't yatsu a bit big to do the levi he's just as a bigger levi a big, big Levi. Would Weiss X Sun be considered a crack ship or a woke ship? Um, hmm. That borders on woke, I'd say. I, I don't know. I I don't see Weiss getting together with a Faunus. I really don't. I'm 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 right there where I'm not a big fan of like, like I. At least following fixing Ruby standards, like if she were written well as a racist beforehand, because she was in volume one, like that sinks deep where I don't see her getting together with a Faunus. I feel like there'd be too much lingering, like psychological complications. Like, <laughs> babe, sorry, I, I, I am a racist. Yeah. <laughs> says a slur in bed <laughs> like she she just you know it, she actually be lucky if she went with blake because blake actually likes fish but can you imagine like any other cat fauna she just like makes like a, a a fish for breakfast in bed and it's just like babe i hate fish what the fuck <laughs> i remember back when monochrome was still viable uh that that was the one I liked back when I was fifteen, sixteen. Those were the days. I, I it remember. Was, I remember back when ships was, were still viable and they weren't just like a yeah. mass of hatred. Yeah, you know, I was talking with my friend earlier, and I mentioned the four main characters in Ruby. I did not mean Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang. I meant Ruby, Weiss, John, and Oscar. <laughs> Don't remind me he exists. Because Bumblebee has made Blake and Yang uh, moot. Yeah, basically. It's weird how, like, the ship destroyed their character. Well, to some degree, like, it, Volume 6 had that... I'm oh, sorry, Volume 7 had that moment where they're discussing things in the back of a truck and ignoring outside outside things. It felt like a real human discussion where they were actual characters for a minute. And there were actual people 
who were actually kind of going towards a relationship, but still sussing things out and where they stood in the world. Like, that felt real. And then literally nothing after that. I like the part where someone was like, hey, maybe you two would work better with other people. And they were like, no, because we're soulmates. And then Blake gets her ass kicked. It was great. <laughs> okay, where were we? Um... Well, she gets her ass kicked in, in actual battle. In the practice, they show some like basic combo, and people are like, wow, amazeballs. That was hella lit, queen. Apologies for saying amaze balls. <laughs> My friend texted me, fall out of question as giga cursed. Anyway, where was I? And we lost her. F's for Molly. F's for Molly in the chat. But Coco didn't wait for that. She was already jumping the whirling tech, throwing out to Hashinop. Holy shit. We just got that entire thing you said in like a second and a half. Like it compressed what? it all down to like a second and a half. Just continue where you were. It's fine. Ugh, that's... Sorry. All right. She turned and put her boot, eh, her boot on his chest. I don't want to hurt you, Coco said. That's my line. Yatsu. Oh. Yatsuhashi grunted. He dropped his sword, grabbed her by the ankle, and pulled her onto, uh, onto her back. He was above her in a moment, jabbing the business end of the sword towards her chest. But now he was moving a little more slowly, more carefully, like he really didn't want to hurt her, like they were sparring. Exactly like when they were sparring. They had gone through those exact motions so many times, Coco didn't even have to think about how to counter him. It was all muscle in the night. She rolled to one side as the blade came down, then looped her leg behind Yatsubashi's and pulled. He fell backwards again, so Coco pushed herself up quickly and smacked his sword away with a backhanded swipe of her purse. Now they were into it. Even though Rumpel had been under the crown's influence during their training exercises with Professor Sunnybrook, she'd been right about one thing. They relied on their weapons far too often, Yatsubashi especially. Keiko had to admit he relied on power in battle and just didn't move as fast as the rest of his team. That wasn't a criticism, just an honest assessment for her, from her as his leader and friend. It didn't matter because they were a team, and their strengths complemented one another. It was when they shared the same weakness that there was a problem. Coco relied on Gianduja Gi a lot and her semblance, which was why she and Yatsuhashi had increased their hand-to-hand -hand combat training so much that it's really in shape. Something that wasn't emphasized much at Beacon. They both wanted to break their bad habits. Isn't this just what they did for Ruby in Volume Yeah, I was going to say, like, what what is this with, like, the whole, like, you rely on your weapons too much type deal? Like, I don't... Especially for Yatsu, the man is a freaking Hulk. Like, just punch them. It's not... Just, just learn how to do a good punch and you're good. They had practiced these moves and dozens of others before to disarm each other to even the match. Now Yatsuhashi was going to disarm Koko. He swung his legs around in the air and hopped back onto his feet. Koko rushed him, but he stole, stood his ground, and this time he swung her purse at him. He grabbed it and twisted, pulling it and sending Koko flying. She lost her purse strap and landed thirty. She lost hold of her purse strap and landed thirty feet away. Yatsuhashi spun her purse around in one hand with a smirk before tossing it beside his sword. He left the weapons there as they came together and began trading blows. Coco designer purse defeats Buster's or something had changed in the middle of the battle, and Coco was fairly sure Yatsuhashi was back. She would test that hunch as they followed the choreography they had rehearsed over and over again. <laughs> They're fight almost like a dance. I hate chat. Just checking. Yatsu could crush the enemy with a clap of his butt cheeks. Oh Christ. <laughs> Yatsu's dummy thick. Thanks, chat. Love you, chat. Also, I'm just gonna Need raise this. Help? I'm just gonna raise this. Uh Remember how Monty described Velvet fighting? No. Because he was like... I was 14. <laughs> yeah. When was when he was 14. like, oh, we need someone to design the costume for Velvet. Think she's very nimble. She's very... Uh, uh, she's a mage-type character, and she moves around a lot. Think jumps around a lot. Does she jump around a lot? 
Does Velvet strike you as someone that moves around a lot when she fights? No. She just mimics other people's combat styles, which they don't move around a lot. I, I To this day, I do not believe the, the weird light projection weapon was what Monty had in mind for her. Sorry, I just wanted to raise that while we're so focused on choreography. Maybe the original that. weapon is that the box was supposed to be a nuke and she was nimble because she could just run away from the blast area really, really fast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I need some help. No, I finally got that accent right. Sage called. No, I got this, Coco said. We'll see about that. Yatsuhashi said. In a lower voice, Coco asked again, You in there, Yatsuhashi? His face didn't change. He was good at hiding emotion. But he whispered back. I'm back in control, but I don't want Jax to realize that. Coco glanced over at the last location she had on Jax. Now he was surrounded by a ring of soldiers. Good, she said. You're going to need to get close to him. Yatsuhashi grunted in assent. And then you know what you have to do, she said. She saw shame and anxiety pass over his face. She blocked a punch and slapped her hand, palm out, into his chest. He stumbled backwards, shaking his head, and he grabbed her arms and they wrestled, pretended to, so he could get closer. That's not a wrestling match. That's 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 about as much of a wrestling match as me and like an empty can of soda. I, I was gonna say, like, that's that's a bear breaking a twig. <laughs> I understand what's necessary. He said when when he was sure no one could hear. Then let's bring the fight closer to Jack's. Coco huffed. Just make it look good. What do you think? Maneuver 12? Yeah, that's why she didn't answer. He just launched right into it. Sorry, I, I'm, just, I'm just so used to reading the, 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 the description that I'm automatically jumping into it after you read something out. Yeah. Sending Coco flying through the air in Jax's general direction. She landed and turned to see Yatsuhashi barreling towards her. She dropped to her back and kicked upwards with both feet to catapult him ever closer to Jack. They executed the move perfectly. Coco ripped off her beret and used it to wipe sweat from her face. The crown's forces had plenty of horror to burn, but fighting was already wearing her out and slowing her down. She surveyed the moonlit battlefield, wondering how long Shade's defenses could hold out. Their numbers were about evenly matched, but the real power was all with Jax and Jill. Neptune had enough to worry well, about without this Coco is a break, in the road. So yeah. if this is a break, I'll read oh, okay. it. Yeah, we'll just keep trading off like that. Neptune had to... Uh, yeah, had had enough to worry about with Koko and the rogue Yatsuhashi intervening in his fight. The crown soldiers had uh, all had ridiculous semblances, and even if he could bring himself to, well, they're not going to show any of them, use his own, it wasn't particularly useful in the desert. On top of that, the enemy seemed pr practically invincible. One moment Neptune was fighting kept disappearing while they fought, only to reappear behind him with a roundhouse kick to his face. But he wasn't going to give, up, uh, give it up to these posers. After all, he was running out of huntsmen and ca um, he was running out of Huntsman Academies these days. Neptune thought he saw a shimmer to his right. He kicked some sand in that general direction and hit something person-shaped. He swung his trident around and zapped her. His opponent grabbed onto the end of his trident and took the full voltage of his electric dust. She pushed back on the weapon and the butt of, the, the butt of it slammed into his chest, knocking the wind out of him. Sage. <laughs> on your left. Sage called as he raced past Neptune and swung his sword at the woman. She turned invisible and his sword passed through air. Uh, then he pitched forward as if someone had kicked uh, him in the back. He caught his balance and uh, brought his sword back around, again swinging, uh, again swinging and missing. Neptune had to laugh before he realized he needed to jump in to help. Oh, okay, it's me again. The bright moon was at its highest point, but when Jill arrived, she somehow outshined it. Nice. Scarlet squinted at the iridescent aura enveloping the woman. Oh, they mean literally. She must have gotten past Sun and the others, but Scarlet couldn't pause to worry about what had happened to his friends. Now it was up to them to shut Jill down. After more than an hour of the most intense fighting Scarlet had ever experienced, would have liked to see that. <laughs> we, 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 we got a super chat. Anime is Raven. art. Honestly, put yourself in Coco's position. If you got clapped by a guy's butt cheeks, would you be jealous, envious, or would you admire them? <laughs> Probably a little bit of all three. A little of all three, I think. Uh, 
I think Coco would then invest in much even tighter jeans after that. Oh, there it is on screen. Okay, there we go. Good. VTuber Coco. VTuber Coco. Yeah. Yeah. All right, where were we? Uh, Jill arrived, yeah. Your read. There was no way he or anyone could beat the Crown's aura enhanced soldiers who had been hand selected for strong semblances. The Shade forces had already been pushed back. The Crown was inside the wall. They were losing. Scarlet ran towards Jill, dodging her forces, firing bullets with the gun in his left hand and blocking attacks with the cutlets in his right. He was peripherally aware that the others had the same idea. Olive and Arslan were close and also heading for Bill, while Coco was still fighting Yantuhashi and too close to Jack for comfort. Scarlet wondered what her play was going to be. Until Jill was defeated, Jax was untouchable as his army. When Coco saw Jill arrive, she stumbled, taking a uh, she stumbled, taking a punch from Yatuhashi full force. He hadn't been pulled uh, back because he hadn't pull been pulling back because he hadn't expected her to let him hit her. Hit her. She sprawled in the sand while he waited for her, not sure what to do. She shook her head and scrambled to her feet, dusting herself off. Uh, Lucky punch. Who is the one saying this? Coco. Coco. Yeah. Lucky punch. She called out for Jax's benefit. They were close to him, close enough to him uh, to watch him fight with obvious enjoyment, but not close enough to make their uh, their move yet. Whatever he was going, whatever that was going to be. She had to get Yatsuhashi within arm's length of him so he could do his thing, but Jax was well protected at the moment. What's wrong? Yatsuhashi asked under his breath as they resumed their fight. Velvet, Sun, and Octavia were supposed to stop Jill from getting here, Coco whispered. Yatsuhashi glanced at Jill. It was his turn to falter, concern over all, of, uh, all over his face. If Jill was here, then Velvet had failed, and they had no way of knowing that, what that meant. The only consolation was that Carmine wasn't yet on the scene. Jill had arrived alone. Maybe Velvet and the others were still keeping the Huntress busy. Coco planted a roundhouse kick in Yatsuhashi's gut. He doubled over. Why? He groaned. <laughs> Jax is watching. She reminded him. Right. Yatsuhashi winced and pulled himself back up. Glad we're on the same side. Coco. I know. I got things I'm taking care of. Anyway, um, my mom is in a trivia game and needed to know a baseball question. Ah. Me too. She breathed. You may not believe it, but I don't, oh, don't enjoy beating you up. I don't believe it, he muttered, swinging wildly, intentionally just missing her. Especially since I can't remember you ever beating me. Well, you've got that memory thing, so... Coco ducked and delivered an uppercut that came just in half inch short of actually hitting him, though he yelled and staggered away from her. Coco uh, rolled her eyes. Tone it down. She mumbled. Now that Jill's here, maybe we should go after her, Yatsuhashi said. Coco considered. She saw Scarlet, Olive, and Arslan all come converging on Jill, and she thought they had the right idea. New plan, she said as Yatsuhashi circled each other. I'll go for Jill. We may not be able to weaken her, but we could keep her from touching anyone else and stealing their aura or delivering it to the troops. Maybe, just maybe, she'll start to run out eventually. She must be stretched pretty thin. You join Jax's guard and wait for a clear shot at Jax. Use your semblance on all of them if you need to. Yatsashi grimaced. He didn't like the idea of that. If I need to, he agreed. Gogo Koko ran straight at Yatsuhashi and tackled him in the chest. Uh, just like she had when... Uh, when wrestling with her brothers growing up. Yatsuhashi folded and she pushed herself up. Eh, I lost my fist. This has not been my day. Good luck. She said. Then she broke away from him and ran towards Jill. Along the way, she scooped up her purse and turned it uh, into a Gatling gun. It was open season. Let's see how much In more... Vacuo, there was an old folk tale about a foolish man who agreed to a staring contest with the sun. After many days, weeks, and months had passed, the, through which the sun had refused to set, the sun finally looked away and ca capitulated the, to the man. In exchange, he had given the man and all his children and children's children better growing crops than anyone else in Remnant. 
So the man won. Young. Young Fox had said to his Uncle Copper the first time he was told the story. Sure, Dev. Copper told him. Not long after. Oh, Not long okay. after that, the man began staring. Uh, began staring at the sun. He lost his eyesight, but he was very good at faking it. He had nothing left to lose, so he pretended that everything was fine. He kept his eyes open, but he was blind for the day. Uh, for the rest of his days. So the moral is that sometimes, in order to win, you have to give up something important. Copper had been. Fox had said. Copper had been quiet for a while. Well, no. The moral is don't look directly at the sun, but other things might be more applicable to you. Sure. Fox liked the story, though, and he always asked Copper to tell it to him before bed, until Copper switched to the boy who cried grim and explained that the moral of the story wasn't don't tell lies, but don't be annoying, because people will just let you die. It's facts. Fox had doubts about what his uncle said, but the story stuck with him. Whenever someone asked Fox what happened to his eyes, he told them he had won a staring contest with the sun, usually with an extra comment, like, I wish I could have been seen the look on his face when I beat him. Or, honestly, it was just blind luck. Sometimes he wondered what it would be like to see, but Fox guessed he had more powerful. Be he was became more powerful because he couldn't. Whatever the reason, Fox sensed Gil Astorius's magnificent aura well before she arrived, coming closer to, sh to shade like the rising sun. Jill was almost too painful for Fox to focus on, but he forced himself to do it while he waited for her to be slowed down or for her blazing presence to be snuffed out by a velvet is so dramatic. When Fox forced himself to look directly at Jill, he immediately detected lines radiating from her towards her twin brother, Jax. It was like a web stretching between them, linking their auras. And it was magnificent. You okay, Fox? Nolan asked. Nolan asked. He stuck by Fox's side when he noticed how his friend seemed overwhelmed. Too many people were fighting close by, which was thwarting Ada's proximity centers, and she couldn't tell the difference between foes and friends as well as his own semblances could. Who's Ada? Ada is his um, assistant device. It's built, built into oh, okay. his... Uh, it, it's like one of those... Um, it's like those phones that use like audio only stuff. His earphones. Oh, are oh, right, right, right. There's too much noise on top of it all, drowning out Fox's ability to listen for audio keys. All he knew was to hit the bright things, and no one yelled directions to him when he needed him. It's much more straightforward and fun to fight good old Grimm instead of other huntsmen. Fox thought. Watch out, Fox! Nolan warned. It's... Nolan stopped mid-sentence. Do a barrel roll. Very funny. Fox said. His head hurt and it was draining his own aura to use his semblance to broadcast constantly to the Beacon Brigade. Nolan? Fox turned in a circle. He already sensed one of the Crown's people behind him, but it wasn't until he turned that he could see her vague shape. Her aura was disordered, but he... He knew who she was when she spoke. <laughs> was Umber the southern one? Umber was the southern one. Hey, Fox. Umber said. Is Nolan okay? Fox sensed his friend's aura, but Nolan wasn't moving. He just can't believe his eyes. Umber said. She's frozen me somehow. No one sent. Oh, yeah. She can freeze people when she makes eye contact. Neptune sent. Fox grinned. That won't be a problem for me. Fox and Umber circled each other. Good. With her eyes on him, Nolan was free from her paralyzing gaze. Thanks. Watch out! No one sent. Can you be more... Oh. oh. Umber had shot one of her whips towards him, and it felt like she was wrapping him up in a sp like a spider and cases its prey and webbing. Spiders confirmed. Nice. What, what does that even mean? Almost... Spiders confirmed. Spiders confirmed. Spiders confirmed. Spiders have been confirmed. There are, there, are, there are confirmed real spiders. Hmm. 
Umber almost never used her weapons in a fight. She didn't need to with such a killer semblance. Fox extended his tonfa and sliced through one of the whips. He reached out for the other, missed, then grabbed it, and he pulled, sending Umber spinning. She grunted, and then felt a loop of the leather settle over his neck, and tighten as she pulled him towards her. He started to choke. He brought up his elbows and scissored the blades of his weapons. He and Umber tumbled away from each other. <laughs> oh, girlfriend in chat. Girlfriend in chat, okay. Hi, girlfriend. How's it going? <laughs> He's here now. She says spiders confirmed. <laughs> nice. He and, Umber he and Umber tumbled away from each other. Fox fell and then quickly arched his back, legs in the air, and hopped back onto his feet. You were a bad teammate. Fox said, thinking bitterly of the reinitiation experiment. She's behind you! No one sent. Fox went around. You were a bad leader, Umber said. You're a bad person, too. How can you support the crown? Because the next time Bakuo was invaded, I want us to win. Umber moved slowly around Fox. He turned to track her motion. You think Theodore and a bunch of students are going to be enough against whatever brought down Ozpin and Beacon? My money's on Jackson, too. Umber laughed. By the way, you're also a bad fighter. And you're a bad liar. Fox activated the guns in his weapons, but before he could fire him, he felt whips tighten around his ankles. She tugged hard and his feet flew out from under him. He ate sand. You and I should have seen that one coming. Uh, Scarlet was the first to reach Jill and the first to attack. He was surprised that it had been so easy to reach her, unlike her brother. She wasn't relying on other huntsmen to protect her. But then he realized she didn't need any protection. She was prepared to defend herself, and she had a massive reserve of aura making her impervious to his sword and bullets. Uh, Jill... Jill pulled the bow from her sling in the back and drew an arrow in one smooth motion, sending it sailing towards him. He knocked it out of the way with his cutlass, barely, and then he fired at her uh, with his pistol. She didn't even dodge, just accepted the full force of his bullets. She fired another arrow as she ran towards him, and another. He blocked them just be as before, but uh, then she was right in front of him, reaching out a hand. He heard gunfire and then dust bullets exploded against Jill, amped up by Coco's semblance. Jill stepped back, swatting her face as though uh, the explosive rounds was no, were no more than bugs. She dropped her bow over Scarlet's head and spun around, sending him into the air. He tried to glide uh, to a safe touchdown, but he was too low, on the, uh, too low to the ground. He skimmed over the sand and hit, a few, um, hit it a few times and bounced into the air like, uh, like a skipping stone and then crashed to a halt. For a moment, he just lay there, stunned. Coco kept firing at Jill, but as far as she could tell, she wasn't making a dent in her aura. It was just like the fight with Carmine earlier. And Pan, then. First ahead. Coco thought as she swung at Jill. The other woman didn't even flinch, but Coco was satisfied to have wiped the smile off her face. Briefly. I'm surprised Theodore is letting students fight his battles for him. Jill taunted. I'm surprised you're fighting at all, Coco snapped. Don't you usually hide behind stronger fighters, drink innocent people of their aura? Coco was ready for the woman's arrows when they came flying towards her. Coco held up her bag to block them. You have a strong aura, Jill said. And it's 100% mine, not stolen like yours, Coco retorted, advancing. Soon your aura will become 100% mine, too. Jill reached out to touch Coco. No way, I'm still using it. Coco reached, too, grabbed Jill by the forearm and elbow, pulling her forward. Jill was caught off balance, and Coco shifted her grip to her hair. She brought a knee into Jill's face as she pushed down on her head. Jill scrabbled around for her hands, fingernails, digging into Coco's skin like claws. This was when Coco noticed a small crown-shaped mark on the inside of Jill's wrist. Is that supposed to be a birthmark? She asked. Jill held tighter and stared hard at Coco. Coco gasped as she felt aura being drawn out of her. She collapsed onto her knees. Oh, boy. Whoa. I'm serious. It looks more like a brand, Coco said faintly. Did your dad put that mark on you, or did you do it yourself? It was like her very breath was being pulled from her lungs along with her aura. She couldn't breathe. She couldn't think. She fumbled for her purse with her free hand, but she was losing strength. She could barely lift it. Her purse fell to the sand. 
Only one kid in a generation is supposed to be born with the oil. Coco could hardly form the words. The edges of her vision were blurring and dimming. When she'll let her go, Coco collapsed beside her purse. She could only watch while the woman examined the mark on her wrist. And she could only wonder where the moon had gone. Was there supposed to be an eclipse tonight, or was she losing all sense along with her aura? And she realized eclipses don't have massive leathery wings. The ravagers do. Heads up. Coco choked. Jill looked up just as the flying grim swooped down to scoop her in its claws. Coco rolled over and slowly dragged herself to her feet. That Grimm wasn't going to be any match for Jill, but it had bought Coco some time. Now from where she stood, Coco could see Grimm pouring through the broken wall into shade. She was almost happy to see them. The Grimm have arrived, Coco said. It's about time. No one responded. Hello? Fox? Coco realized she was just talking to herself. She looked around the battlefield and saw Fox and Nolan fighting against Umber. She didn't need an aura meter to know Fox was almost out of juice. Coco surveyed the rest of the battle. Professors Rumpel and Sunnywick were fighting side by side, now moving towards the Grimm. Students were still taking on the Crown soldiers, but they were slowly losing the battle. They needed reinforcements, a new edge. And right now, Coco couldn't see how they were going to get through either Jill's or Jax's defenses, so it was a matter of time before the battle was lost. But even when you know you're going to lose, you keep fighting. Coco watched had Master Theodore boxing his way through Jax's guards. <laughs> we got a super chat. Oh, yo, anime is art. Yo, imagine if Jill, uh, with her semblance, was a maiden. Holy shit! Yeah, that would be fucking op. That, like, that's you that's, take over the world with that. Yeah, it's almost that's almost interesting. <laughs> Please continue. It was slow going. And in response, Jax was calling more and more huntsmen around him. Meanwhile, Yatsuhashi hung on nearby, half-heartedly fighting against his own side until he'd get shot at Jax. So, Coco said. She had an idea. She tried calling Yatsuhashi on her scroll. Something was jamming the signal. Now was a really bad time for Fox's team speak to be out. Coco started running back towards Yatsuhashi. All right, we're going to take a brief break here so I can use the restroom and such. We'll be right back, people. I'm in charge of chat. I, I was just uh, sorry. I was I I was just going to do it to the well, we'll be right back message. But if you want to take over for chat, yeah, fine, sure. Oh, I love I'm taking over. I love being the center of attention because I'm uh, arrogant, I guess. Um, chat, what do you want to know? Thoughts on Miles leaving Rooster Teeth. I think it's hilarious just to see Rooster Teeth slowly collapse. Um, you know. I know this is a random question, but which character do you think is the thickest? The answer is always Kali. The real curse of Kali is that I think that she gave... She, she you know, it's like, it's like a deal with the devil. So she got, like, cat milf figure, right? But also her daughter's Blake. You know? It's like it's like you ask the genie to make you a milf, and like the catch is that you're you're the milf, but the kid that makes you the milf. It's terrible. What makes you worried about volume eight? Um, the fact that it takes place in forty eight hours. I uh, because you know I I don't know how they can drag out things like that. Um, also that they will not use people correctly. Uh. When is Tiny Weiss debuting her career as a VTuber? Now, if you if you would let it let it happen, um, if you could design redesign an outfit for Sn or or Kiffy, what would you do? Uh, I don't know why you used wood like the bark, but um, well, 
if I could redesign one of them, I guess I would redesign Velvet. I, really, I never really liked like the bodysuit she has going on. I can remember. Actually, I haven't looked at Velvet's design in like three years. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that thing she has going on. Um, volume 6 is three days? Oh, okay. Half of that was good, that's true. Um, have I heard of Aviva? No, but I have a lot of friends named Aviva. Common name. Um... Make Tiny Weiss and Mini Marnie battle to this? No! Marnie's asleep! Guys! Does this mean Blake will inherit Kali's thickness? I... Uh, no, that was part of the deal for the devil. Why does everyone like Velvet? Because she's an inoffensive character, which is... She doesn't just... She's, there's nothing grating about her inherently, so... Um... Will Tiny Weiss ever apologize to Mini Marnie for stealing her lunch that one time? Weiss is just too... She has too much... Like, she's too haughty for that. Uh, which character, Ruby character is most like you, Molly? Um, well, I have a personality which rules out most of the Ruby cast. But... I don't know. Yes. I, don't, I really don't know. I, I've never thought about that. I, Weiss is my favorite, but I don't, like, relate to her. And we're starting at page 232. So we have 14 pages. Oh, before we get to the epilogue. Wonderful. Have also, you watched hi. Meta Runner? No, I haven't. I'm back. Uh, a few Why comments do people on the even like Raven? About. What? Why do people even like Raven? I don't know. Uh, she's awful both in terms of her personality and how she's written. I don't know. She's not even hot, so you can't use that as an excuse. Her voice acting's terrible. You can't use that as an excuse. Um. The um, I was gonna say the uh, Callie's Callie's milfness was a literal monkey's paw. Uh, now that she's with you know, banging son, we all know that happened, right? We're we're all in agreement. That's what happened. Uh. God, I really I they just make it like so. Uh, Callie's gonna have. That's how Callie's gonna, how Gira's gonna know that Callie cheated on him. The child that's gonna pop out is gonna be some random Faunus. Because, like, that's how Faunus work. If you're two Faunus of different type, you just have a random ass. It's gonna be a fucking, I don't know, spider Faunus or something like that. Spiders, snakes confirmed. <laughs> snakes confirmed. It's like my favorite clip of any YouTube video. <laughs> snakes confirmed. We got. Okay. Well, let's get into this. this. This chapter looks fucking crazy. All right. Jill struggled in the talons of the Ravager as it carried her high above the battlefield. Her forces were winning against the head uh, against Headmaster Theodore and his students. The Grim were a complication, however. Uh, for the record, if they're already at Vacuo, the, the at at Shade Academy, which is in the center of Vacuo, that means the Grim are running rampant. Throughout all of Vacuo. Am I understanding that correctly? The logistics of this. Right? I'm not crazy. Okay. Alright. So we're all in agreement that people are dying in mass because of this. Got it. Um, she, fitted, uh, she fitted an arrow and aimed at the Ravager's uh, gruesome face. Letting the arrow fly. The tip pierced the mask, splintering it, and the arrow embedded itself halfway into the monster's head. The Grim dropped. Jill secured her bow and grabbed two arrows, clutching one in each hand, points down. She watched another Ravager flying uh, below her and adjusted her tra tra trajectory so she would pass uh, just ahead of it. As she did so, she flung out her arms to plunge the arrow into the Grim's neck. Her momentum carried her down and around, slicing through the smoky flesh and swinging around, um, out from, around, from under the beast. Jill landed not far from Jax's position. Her aura absorbed most of the impact and created a deep impression in the sand, but it was a significant hit. A little uh, behind her, she heard the Ravager's body and head crash into the building. 
Jill climbed out of the crater and watched the creature dissipate into black mist. Uh, Grim were uh, swarming the campus now, and Jill's forces were engaging them. They were taking heavy damage. One of the problems with their soldiers was that they were too reckless, too cavalier about conserving their aura. They figured she would just give them more if, she ne if they needed it, not considering that she would only be in one place at a time. And even her reserves had limits. She had already had half the amount of the aura she had when she started uh, from before the battle. No offense to this author, but this is about as engagingly written as the fanfics I wrote when I was 16. Yeah. They needed to secure the school quickly and defeat, it, uh, defeat or drive away Theodore and his group. Jill tucked her atten uh, turned her attention back to the battle, Bo, ready, uh, Bo at the ready, and noticed dozens of students heading, uh, heading for her. From behind, another wave of Grimm was moving in. Yasuhashi yes, was, was glad to see the Grimm. You go. We're, we're so, we're so, yeah, we're switching. It's the final chapter. We gotta switch off. Yasuhashi yes, was glad to see the Grimm. He could fight instead of his fight them instead of his classmates from shade without holding back or feeling guilty. He felt bad enough that he allowed Jax to control him for even a short period. Yatsuhashi had become fully aware of everything he was doing under Jax's will, and somehow he was convinced that it was the right thing to do. It was like watching a film, though. On some level, Jax had made Yatsuhashi believe that he didn't. He had supported the Crown's goals, that he would do anything to protect them. That he had hated outsiders, especially with Team Coffee. With those alterations to his memory, to his very identity, a new Yatsuhashi had been born with unrestricted anger, afraid to use his strength to serve Jax. Meanwhile, the real Yatsuhashi submerged in his consciousness, could only watch and struggle to regain control. He had to work out a way to turn his semblance against himself for the, fir for the first time, losing some of his own memory in order to cast off Jax's programming and reassert independence. So it seemed Yatsuhashi could now make himself forget things selectively, and that was just as terrifying a thought as using it against others. Koko had helped too. Yatsuhashi was sure of it. Actions were tied to memory as they fought and slipped into a familiar routine. Yatsuhashi shifted into autopilot. It had freed enough of his attention and resources to wipe the fake thoughts planted by Jax. But now he had to keep pretending so Jax wouldn't notice, and that would mean he couldn't tell his friend, the one he was fighting, that he was really on their side. The Grim wouldn't care, though. Yasuhashi needed to stick close to Jax. Fortunately, a Dramadon was heading his way. He retrieved his sword and jumped in front of it, prepared to dodge his acid spit. The Dramadon glared at him, its eyes burning with hatred and rage, and it charged right past him. Huh? Yatsuhashi turned to see the Dramadon tackle one of the crown's huntsmen from behind. Its powerful jaws clamped around his shoulder. Yatsuhashi stood, dumbfounded as he watched the man struggle with the grim. Why had he gone for him instead of Yatsuhashi? He watched another Dramadon run away from Arslan and head for someone wearing a silver armband. An even larger group was converging around the glowing woman, Jill Asturias. The grim were like moths drawn to a flame. Yatsuhashi scrolled buzz. He pulled it out, hoping it would be velvet. It was some sort of emergency broadcast. Yes, I know. We're having That's an emergency. He tried to silence it, but it kept buzzing. No, other scrolls were buzzing all around him. Yatsashi took advantage of the distraction to work his way closer to Jax. Headmaster Theodore was still fighting, of course, and Jax didn't have a scroll. Yatsashi snuck a look for other scrolls as he headed for Jax. He stopped when he saw Sun's confused face appear on the screen. The buzzing had stopped on every scroll present began transmitting the same message. Is this thing on? Sun's voice echoed on dozens of scrolls across the campus. I think so, said Velvet. Go ahead. Velvet. Yatsuhashi pulled out his own scroll and watched Sun speak. Hey, um, Vacuo. My name's Sun Wukong. I, I grew up here, so some of you might remember me. I I'm sorry I left a little while ago, but I came home to study at Shade. Home is important to us, right? I know we all move around at some point, and many of us don't have one city or another village to settle in, but if there's one thing I've learned these past few months, it's that home is, isn't really a place. It's more the people you keep coming back to. Right now, there's a battle raging in our city. You, you may have heard it from the, of the Crown, the people who say they're heirs to the Vacuo's throne. I don't know about you, but I don't need a king or queen telling me what to do. We've gone a long time fending for ourselves, and it's made us strong. I'm not ready for that to change. Maybe you don't agree. Maybe you think that would be nicer to have someone protecting you. Nice to go back to the old ways. They say that they can make Vacuo a paradise again, but we all know that Vacuo was gone. Uh, that Vacuo was gone. Uh, we all move, uh, we've all moved on, but they haven't. Remember, those people have been missing for the last year? All those faces from the Weeping Wall? Well, my friends, I found them. The screen panned to a group of uh, pale, exhausted Vacuans, and nonetheless smiled and waved. 
One kid called out, Am I on TV? People around Yatsuhashi murmured. And I know who took them. Jackson Jill Asturias. What, what, what are you doing? This is just what's going through my head right now. <laughs> I just don't care about Sun's monologue. Right now, they're fighting my friends in the, Shade students, uh, in the Students of Shade Academy for control of Vacuo. The Crown has been using Vacuo and citizens, draining them of aura, brainwashing them to fight. Jax and Jill aren't real leaders. They're tyrants. Long ago, we lost our identity in the way, life be uh, in the way of life because people became too content. And then the Fire Nation attacked. Wait, I mean, uh, we let other kingdoms come here and take what they wanted from us to work... Uh, to work mining dust, let us die in their mines, and then they left us with nothing but sand and heat. They promised us prosperity in paradise, but we ended up uh, with nothing but bitter memories. But we did hold on to something. We have a home. We have each other. Now you, uh, you have to make a choice. Every person here has to decide. Uh, has to decide. Do you want to stay in charge of Vacuo's destiny, or do you want to give it all up to Jax and Jill, who have already shown us the kind of rulers they are? People who would take what they want by force. Ah, uh, don't use that. Don't use that song. What song? Nintendo. Nintendo loves copyright claiming that shit. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. Okay. Well, I shouldn't. I should have played the Super Mario Land OSD then. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, that because they, they um they get me for um the shop theme. I love that shop theme, but they get me every single time I try to use it. Um. Shit. Okay. Uh, but now, uh, but we did have something to hold on to. We have a uh, we have a home. We have each other. Now you have to make a choice. Every person here has to decide. Do you want to stay in charge of Vacuo's destiny, or do you want to give it all up to Jax and Jill, who have already shown us the kind of rulers they are? Uh, people who take what they want by force, who care only about themselves. Uh, the days of trusting in one uh, others to defend you and our home are over. Uh... We need everyone to join us at Shade Academy right now, and show uh, right now, and show the crown who we are. Whether you fought before or not, grab a weapon, make yourself loud, and join us. This isn't the Huntsman's fight, but you can't. Uh, this isn't the Huntsman's just the Huntsman's fight, and you can't wait for us to save you, because that's how we do things in Vacuo. Not anymore. Oh, because that's not how we do things in Vacuo. Not anymore. Okay, you're up. Oh, thank, thank, thank goodness. I'm sorry for killing your channel. Not yet. Not yet, but you almost did. We got close. The transmission cut off. Someone began laughing. Yet she looked up and saw without surprise that it was Jax. That was the most pathetic, desperate thing I've ever seen. You know you've lost. Why keep fighting? Was that the voice I gave him? Maybe. Yeah, it was really obnoxious. You're still reading. <laughs> Jax cackled. Theodore approached him to answer. Because we never give up. Because this place belongs to all of us, not just you. They aren't going to save you. Jack said, rolling his eyes dramatically. Yatsuashi checked his scroll. It had a signal again. Whatever Velvet had done with the network must have been blocking it before, but their message delivered is clear again. Yatsuashi had a message of his own now, and his own way to deliver it, so he texted Fox. Oh, God. All right. A voice Play charge. Are you playing this music to mock Sun? Yes. That's why I'm playing the silly music over his speech. Yeah. I don't know why he's le like. I'm just like, uh, like, yes, Granny, go out there and start hitting people with a frying pan. Hey, yes, three-year-old child, you can have this gun. I'm just imagining that right now. A voice popped into Jill's head, but it wasn't speaking to her exactly. It sounded weak, but it was speaking to everyone. Uh. Hey. It's uh, Fox. Oh, it's Fox. Okay. Hey, I'm back. So, oh, anime is art. <laughs> So Vacuo was a paradise, and now it's bad. Jill and Jack want to res uh, restore Vacuo and make it strong, and Sun wants to stay, uh, wants it to stay bad. This sounds dumb. Yeah. 
Now you, when you say Bro, it I'm like sorry that. for playing Nintendo music. <laughs> Nintendo, don't kill me. Uh, yeah, where were we? Hey, I'm back. Sorry about that. The person sent. This must be Fox Alistar. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait, are you reading or am I reading? I'm reading. Uh, You're reading. Yeah. This must be Fox Alistair, uh, Jill realized. Carmina told her uh, about him and his friends who had sp uh, stopped her and Berta like from bringing in the asset. Uh, the asset. I'm going to make this quick. I don't know how long I've been doing this. Stop it, Umber. Uh, Jill turned her attention to the battlefield. Uh, she saw a dark-skinned boy with red hair fighting against their shade operative. Why didn't Umber just use her stone gl uh, glance to silence him? Long story short, it looks like the Grim are uh, attracted to the pretty aura coming off Jill. Uh, Jill Asturias and the Crown Forces. Who's Argento? Who the fuck is Argento? What? Uh, uh. Oh, it was one of the the baddies from from the first from the first few chapters. Oh, what? Argento said. He was joined uh, by confused comments from the other Crownsmen. Jill looked around at the Grim, who have been advancing on our position. Um, could that be? Could that be what's happening? Jill had experimented once with transferring aura into Grim that uh, that had been roaming near the uh, the wasteland base. The aura had been absorbed quickly and began uh, pulling more from uh, from Jill faster and faster until she ended their connection. The Grim hadn't seemed uh, hadn't seemed altered by the aura at all. Whatever they were, they didn't use it uh, for power, and they didn't have souls, but it had consumed the aura, and she had wondered if the thing that drew Grimm so strongly to humans and Faunus wasn't just their emotions. After all, even animals had those, but perhaps also their very souls, their aura. It was, If that was the case, she was maybe in trouble here. This is my point. Do not attack the Grimm unless they attack you first, Fox sent. Let them go after the Crown's army and the, uh, the Arsturias twins. What? Another Crown soldier said. Um, and then the drums began from the other side of the wall. Jill turned to see a stream of people entering Shade Academy's campus, banging pots and boxes, carrying guns, swords, and knives, bows and arrows, and maces. Uh, they weren't huntsman weapons, uh, and this, but this was vacuo, and everyone was armed, even in the city. And they were coming for a fight. Because it's tough. Did everyone take a drink? For the first time, Jill was worried. She raised her brow. Is the Grimmer attracted to Aura now? I guess. Oh my god, is that going to be like the twist of the entire series where at the very end it's just going to be like everyone loses their Aura? Like Ruby's going to be like, we can save everyone, but we all have to sacrifice our Aura. And like the Grimmer is that like, like uh, what what that that's like an ending I've seen before where like the sacrifice is like the characters have to stop like have to not be magic or something. All right, well here we go. You're up. It's Coco time. At least it's Coco time. <laughs> Chad is having having a moment. CJ's having a moment. I'm sure. CJ, deep breaths. Get your inhaler. Take a deep breath. Coco couldn't believe the Grimmer on their side. Sort of. Hilariously, it didn't even matter. <laughs> Star versus. That's what it was. Thank you, Brady. Um, anyway. Hilariously, it didn't even matter if what Fox said was true. All that mattered was that the Crown's army brought... Bought it, and the resulting panic attracted twice as many Grim as before. And by attacking the only Crown soldiers, the Grim were working with the Huntsmen for once, doing the job for them. With Ravager's deck up, and even as a wrath pinning down the Crownsmen, Shade's forces uh, could concentrate on Jill Astorius while Yazahashi attacked Jess. Jax. Of course, once they stopped the Crown and their, their soldiers, the Grim would turn on everyone equally, but they would handle that when the time came. The problem there was that was the problem Coco would be all too happy to deal with. The Grim were easy compared to the fighting supercharged huntsmen. The Grim were at least predictable, except today, she supposed. Coco hurried over to Headmaster Theodore, who was watching the Grim surround Jackson and his guards being vaguely disappointed. Everything okay, sir? Uh, 
Miss Adele, you've been doing fine work out here. Don't think I ever noticed, but this... This is a natural. <laughs> the world is changing, sir. Theodore frowned. More than you know. But you aren't here to check on me. Let's talk strategy. What's your idea? Coco was surprised he had read her so easily, but it saved some of her time. Yosuashi isn't under Jax's control anymore. I noticed. Theodore said. If we could get him to Jax, he can use the semblance to temporarily wipe Jax's mind and disorient him. Break his hold on the army. The part that's brainwash, anyway. Theodore nodded slowly. I like it. But how are we going to do it? Coco liked the idea of, of a headmaster asking her what to do, but she didn't have time to save right now. I want you to pretend to fight him, and then punch him really hard. Pretend to? You want to raise an, an eyebrow? No, actually punch him, Coco demonstrated. Hard enough to send him directly towards Jax. Theodore's face lit up. Good! I haven't made a challenge the young Mr. Dai Chi to about. He clicked his gloves together. I'm on it! Pre Professor Theodore headed for Yatsuhashi. Coco wondered if he was going to tell Yatsuhashi the plan first. If not, though, she trusted her teammate. Meh, they'll figure it out. Neptune joined the, the rest of Shade forces and the citizens of Vacuo in firing on Gil uh, Jill Astorius. Up close, uh, she was fighting Grimm with an old-style bow and arrow, and some impressive moves. She would have been a great huntress, he thought. Then Neptune was distracted by the sight of Headmaster Theodore sit, uh, straight across the battlefield towards Yazuhashi, who was fighting some jackalopes, even though they didn't seem that interested in him. Hey, look! Neptune called. This should be good. Jill was surrounded, exhausted, running out of aura. If she waited too much longer, she really would run out, and then everyone would run out, including her brother. If she took back some aura now, she might survive a little longer in this fight against the Grim and Shade students and the faculty, not to mention the damn civilians from the city. She looked across at Jax, who was still protected by his king's guard from the group of Grim closing in on them. The shadow of a ravager passed overhead. She locked eyes with her brother for a moment. They had always had a special connection beyond just the aura linking them, so she knew he would understand when he she shrugged and mouthed. I'm sorry. Jax's eyes widened. He shook his head. Jill began making her way towards the twin, forcing a path to the Grim and reaching out to the crown soldiers as she passed them, pulling back whatever she needed for her and Jax. Fox noticed how much Jill Asturias' aura had dimmed, and as she walked past her soldiers, their lights flickered out uh, and, her fl uh, and hers flared brighter. Their bottomless supply had been cut off. They were on their own now. Here it comes, Nolan said. What? What's happening? Fox asked. Theodore is taking uh, down Yatsuhashi. I wish you, uh, we were taking bets on this. Who would you bet on? Fox asked. Theodore, of course, Nolan said. I bet on Yatsuhashi, Fox lied. He had, support, he had to support his teammate, but Yatsuhashi was going to get creamed. Fox was glad he didn't have it to witness it. But then he heard the boom when Theodore punched his friend. Yatsuhashi held his held up his hands as Headmaster Theodore stopped towards him. Sir. Yatsuhashi whispered. I'm with you. Jax isn't controlling me anymore. But Theodore acted like he hadn't heard. Come on, Daichi! Fight! He egged on. Theodore tossed right and Yatsuhashi dodged it. Then Theodore fainted with his left and punched again with his right. It clipped Yatsuhashi in the shoulder. It didn't hurt much, but Yatsuhashi was so tired. Please, sir, I have to get the jacks. I might be able to end this. Theodore winked. Get ready. Ready? For what? Now is your chance to fly! Theodore wound up and delivered a powerful uppercut to Yatsuhashi's chest. The gravity dust on his gloves war warped... Sound, the gravity dust on his gloves warped sound in Yatsuhashi's sentence, senses for a moment. By the time he heard the boom, he was flying backwards across the field toward Jax. Yatsuhashi spun around and extended his arms like he was flying. Jax wasn't there anymore. Yatsuhashi sailed past the spot Jax had been standing only a moment ago and crashed into the back of his erect. He bounced off and landed in the sand, stunned. He couldn't breathe or move and his aura was down by half. He watched as the giraffe turned toward him and lowered his head to charge. 
Luckily, the Zaraph wasn't interested in him. He would go straight for the strongest source of aura in the vicinity, which now included Jackson Jill. Yasunashi groaned and pulled himself to his feet. He swayed unsteadily, and, but he prepared himself as the Zaraph headed towards him. Oh, is he going to ride the Zaraph? It's going to be fun. It'll be great. Koko wins as Yasuhashi missed uh, Jax, who is now fighting his way towards his sister, swinging a tarnished curve blade. Uh, Koko ran to intercept him, slightly impressed that he could fight at all. Jax had trained to be a huntsman too, but he didn't seem the type to let other. He, but he seemed the type to let others do his dirty work. He was clearly trying to help his sister, though, as she was uh, as she had been overwhelmed by practically uh, Shade's entire army and was now trailed uh, by an army of Grimm. His weapon was just a sword. Uh, like one of the antiques Coco had set, uh, seen on Professor Rumpel's wall, maybe another artifact from Vacuo's olden days. Jack showed uh, more force than skill as he waved it around in his attempt to keep Grimm and Huntsman al alike out of his way while he struggled towards Jill. You came for me, Jill said when he finally reached his sister's side. Of course, he would do the same, Jack said. Man, I guess obnoxious voices just run the family. Yeah. The two of them huddled uh, while bullets rain, uh, rain, rained on them. The Grim were closing in too, but Jax knew uh, that was only one of Jill's problems. More importantly, she was weakening by the second. We came into this world together, and we'll leave it together, he promised. We can escape, Jill insisted. I still have enough aura. No, Jack said firmly. We aren't leaving. This is our moment. What we've spent our whole lives building towards... We've lost, Jill said. Somehow we've lost. You heard that, kid. We're from Vacuo, and that means we never stop fighting. Jack stood and turned to face the bullets head on. If we can't take Shad Academy, I'll settle for destroying it. We'll, we'll die if we stay, Jill said, her voice barely audible. Jax looked at his sister. Then we die. You can't do an exclamation point and her voice barely audible. How am I supposed to read that? Uh, Jill stared at him, horrified. He had seen that look a long time ago, when there were students at Shade and uh, he had told her he was going to be expelled. He had asked her to come with him. With almost the last of her strength, she uh, felt her uh, he felt her sever the link between them. Jill was starting to pull back the aura he had, the aura uh, she had given him, to save herself. A bullet pierced his left arm. He cried out and saw blood. Uh, he felt a burning pain. What are you doing? Stop! Jax grabbed her arm. She was stronger than him. A better fighter, but he only needed a moment. Give me all your aura. He told Jill. Uh, give me- oh, sorry, it's me. Give me all your aura. Oh, sorry. He told Jill. Her eyes widened. As you wish. She said. And she did. Jack stood in front of her to shield her from the, uh, from the bullets. He had tried. Uh, he had tried this before when they were kids. Shortly before uh, she had first given him enough aura to activate his semblance. That was when he learned that he could make suggestions to other people, or with a little more effort, to make them do what he wanted. Back then, he'd hoped that uh, he'd hoped that if he drained Jill of aura, he would never have to rely on their connection again. But that plan had failed. Jill couldn't give away everything she had because she needed some aura to send aura. It was possible she could never lose all of it, just as she hadn't been able to drain all him of all of his aura in the womb. One more hit would probably kill Jill. I only did what you would have done. Um, what you would have done, he told her. What you already did before we were even born. <laughs> the chat. What? I can't even say it. Insane oddball. Look at his gun. Yep, no, that's about accurate. Uh, he now had enough power to keep her and the Crown Army under his control to the bitter end. He would watch Shade Academy burn, or he would watch everything he had created burn. The gunfire uh, ground to a halt, and suddenly everyone was looking at him. Even the Grim seemed to be wanting, uh, waiting for something to happen. A shadow loomed. Jack's turn to see a Xeroth lunging for him. This probably isn't the strangest thing I've ever done. Yasuhashi thought as he rode the large grim across the battlefield, steering by yanking on each of its remaining two necks. He waved one at Neptune, Olive, and Arslan as he passed their astonished faces. No. 
he realized, remembering his ride on the back of a giant desert turtle. This isn't even the strangest thing I've done this year. He watched as Jill crumpled to the sand and Jack stood over her. I, I literally love this, like, you have this, like, moment where someone's dying and it switches to Yatsuhashi being wacky and crazy. I mean, that's kind of how Ruby is. Right I, back. I, that's one thing I do appreciate about Ruby, actually, is that there's a weird juxtaposition between sharp comedy and really dour moments. Like, they don't do it very well very often, but, like, I, I feel like that's the potential the series has, where you can have, like, really sad moments completely juxtaposed almost immediately by really comedic ones. And then right back, he watched as Jill crumpled to the sand and Jack stood over her. Yatsuhashi glowered at them both. As the Zaraf drew near an attack, Yasuhashi launched himself from its back and tackled Jack out of the way of the grim snapping jaws. They wrestled on the ground, each of them using their semblance on, on the other. Stop fighting me! I'm not your enemy! The battlefield swirled around Yatsuhashi, and Jax's voice seemed to hammer into his brain. His grip loosened, but he shook his head and flipped Jax onto his back forcefully. No. You Yatsuhashi listen to growled. me. Forget. Yatsuhashi pinned him, knees pressing into Jax's chest. Now that they were so close, he could see Jax wasn't much older than him. Yatsuhashi was stronger, heavier physically. Jax had more aura right now, and Yatsuhashi was running low. Too low to put much into his semblance. After all of this, he was going to fail. He felt himself slipping back into the dark corner of his mind as Jax restored control over him. Then he felt a hand on his arm. He looked or he looked and saw Jill, the last thing he needed. He started to shake her off when he saw the other hand on, on Jax's shoulder. And then Yatsuhashi felt aura flood into him, like a breath of fresh air. He punched it all, all, it all into a semblance, making Jax forget. Jax suddenly went slack. He felt Jax's presence jolt out of his mind. And when he looked around, he saw many crowned soldiers' faces waking up on the battlefield. Silver, Jill said weakly. Of course, the, the woman in the bad guy pair is actually the sympathetic one. Yeah. Who would have guessed? Uh, yes, he isn't controlling you anymore. That's what she said. She gave him a puzzled look. Jax wasn't controlling me. That's who asked he gaped at her. He wasn't? You mean all those things you did? He looked out over the battlefield. All this, you did it because... I love him. He's my brother. Oh, he had a destiny. And why did you help me? Yatsurashi asked. Because if I didn't, we both would have died. She closed her eyes. I almost killed him myself at the end, because I didn't want to go. The huntsmen on the battlefield were either running away, those who had been loyal to Jax, without the need for him to control them, or fighting the grim side by side with the shade students and faculty. Jax, meanwhile, was lying still, stupefied at Yatsurashi's feet, eyes wide open. Jax? Yatsurashi asked. Rex? Yeah, that's an old <laughs> reference. No, re no response, but tears were streaming down the man's cheeks. If you wanted to, you could wipe out anyone's mind clean. If you wanted to, you could wipe anyone's mind clean. Jackson said. Yes, actually stumbled back, disgusted with himself. In the heat of the moment, he might have overdone it, but he never intended to go that far. This is why he avoided using a semblance for so long. Y'all too? Velvet was standing behind him, looking for him to... Looking for him to Jax on the ground. Looking from him to Jax on the ground. She drew closer and reached out to hug him. He pulled away. Don't touch me. He mumbled. She froze. You did good. You did what you had to. He froze. He nodded. But he didn't want to talk about it. Not yet. Uh, where is it? There's still a bit to do. They surveyed the battlefield as dawn broke over the horizon. It was humans and faunus against Grimm, as it should be. Everyone in Vacuo united for one cause. That had been Velvet and, and Sun's doing, and in a strange way, it was also because of Jax. He wanted to bring everyone together like the Vacuo of old, and he succeeded. It's just, it'll be nice just to be, eh, it'll be nice to just be fighting Grimm again, Velvet said quietly. I was just thinking that. Yeah, that's how she said. As a spotted them and charged in their direction, Velvet summoned a hard light version of Coco's gun. We'll defend them. She nodded towards Jill and Jax. You won't leave their sides. Yatsuhashi stood next to Velvet and drew his sword. All right. 
All right, team. I'm gonna change the the title of the stream to 19, 20, 21. Why is this epilogue like 17 pages? No, it's not 17. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven pages. Mm -hmm. All right, we can rock that. Let's do it, folks. We're in the end game now. I can't believe you guys have stuck with us for so long. Yes, this has been a wonderful time. Someone's actually enjoying the first Beacon Brigade meeting after they had taken down the crown. It was a different experience now that they had something to celebrate, and they all felt good this time. With their school, uh, when their school had come under attack, they had fought and won. And they had done it together. Everyone, regardless of where they had come from it uh, in the first place. But it would still be a while before things were back to normal. Uh, at the end of, the long mor of a long morning clearing Shade Academy in the surrounding area of Grimm, the rounding up of the crown's still loyal soldiers, like Umber... Uh, Umber... Gorgonian? What the fuck kind of name is that? She Armenian? She a what? She Armenian? Maybe. Headmaster Theodore had addressed the school. Ugh. I have an air pocket in my stomach. I got to Ugh. I'm proud... Uh, Headmaster addressed the school. I'm proud of each and every one of you, he said, striding back and forth on the battlefield. You've proven to me that when time comes, we will all be ready for the greatest test of, uh, any of us have ever faced. More importantly, I hope you've proven to yourself that you can rise to any occasion and to one another. Several of Shade Academy students nodded their heads and cast apologetic looks at their classmates from Beacon and Haven. Nothing forges bonds with comrades better than the heat of battle, Theodore went on. Professor Rumpel had to clear her throat. But that's for discussion at a later time, Theodore said. For now, let us appreciate our victory in this moment, our shared victory for Bakio. Go on, get some well-earned rest and have some fun. He joined his gloved hands and shook them above his head. After uh, getting some sleep and food, Sun felt, uh, felt like he could do anything. You ready for this? Velvet had asked him before the meeting. Sun nodded. Just one thing I have to do first. She put his ha uh, her hands on her hips. Hold on. Give me two minutes. Okay. All right, so how's it going, chat? You enjoying yourselves? Brady, I can't tell if you're joking or if you're serious. I wouldn't be surprised. Amen to that, CJ. Amen to that. About to go on lunch break. Oh my god, it's almost 6 p.m. here. I cannot wait to go out and get dinner. I always have Penn Station on Thursdays. Hmm, so good. Sorry about that. One of my... One of my roommates uh, is colorblind, and he needed some help with, um, That's with telling the color on something. Uh, she put her hands on her hips. All right. Are you backing out on me? No, it's not that. He pointed to Scarlet Sage and Neptune on the other side of the room. I talked to those guys first. I'll be just a second. Bubba waved him off. Uh, waved him off. Sun hurried over to his team. Hey, Sun said. Hey, said Scarlet, reading him warily. Sun put his hands in his pockets, and then he uh, took them out again and made sure he was looking at the boys. I just wanted to say I'm sorry. I really am. If there's one thing I've learned from all this is that, there, um, is that I wasn't there for you when you needed me. But you were there for me all the way, and that makes me feel even worse. Sage. Right now. Wow, Sage said. He held out his hand. Neptune and Scarlet each other dropped some Leanne into it. 
What's that for? Sun asked. Sun. We had a bet on whether you would ever give us a real apology. And I just won. You bet against me? He looked at Neptune. Neptune shrugged. Sage is my new bestie, Sun announced. Anyway, you were right, Scarlet. Uh, the real reason I dragged you here is, be uh, is because after all we went through went down at Haven, I knew that whatever happened, it was, was whatever was happening in Remnant, it wasn't going to happen uh, there. All the action is going to be at Atlas or Vacuo, and I'm not, uh, and I'm not going, I'm not about to miss it. Scarlet tilted his head. Looks like you were right about that point. He smiled. Apology accepted. I also wanted to say... Wait, really? Don't push it. What else do you have to say? It's on side. If you guys want me to step down as Team Season's leader, I'm totally fine with that. The guys, uh... The guys looked to one another in alarm. Oh no, Scarlet said. That's just another way of running from your responsibilities. Huh? Sun said. Because of this whole uh, reinitiation business, I've seen a lot of different leaders do, d do their thing. Both of those who know what they're doing, like Coco and Arslan, and people who are completely clueless, like Reese. You know what I realized? What? You aren't the worst, Scarlet said. Neptune and Sage nodded. I don't think that's... I think that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me, Sun said. Do you know why we came with you to Vacuo, Sun? Scarlet leaned in. Why? Sun asked. Because we're going to come here with, uh, because we were going to come here with or with, because you were going to come here with or without us. You can tell I'm tired. Uh, we decided. Scarlet gestured to himself. Molly. Molly. No. You okay there, Moles? What happened? You, uh, you dropped. You dropped. I don't know what happened. I, I'm, I'm good now. I'm good now. Okay. You gonna put the face cam back on? Yep, there we go. All right. Where would the stream be without this? I really want to say some snarky things, but oh, I'm gonna bite my tongue on that. <laughs> uh, uh, because you were going to come here with or without us. We decided, Scarlet gestured to himself, Neptune and Sage, we decided to keep the team together because that's what teams do. They stick together no matter what stupid thing one of them does. And we weren't going to do anything to fix our problem waiting around in Mistral. Sooner or later, we're probably uh, probably sooner, uh, you would have gotten bored and disappeared again. That's a really bad life advice. If a team isn't working out, maybe you should reassess being a team. Sage. Uh, yeah. Sage said. We may be in vacuo, but at least we're in vacuo together. And if life is anything, uh, and life is anything but boring, Neptune added. Sun opened his arms. Bring it in, guys. We need to hug this out. That's okay. Scarlet walked away. Sun watched him go uh, over and talk to Nolan. He lost his team again when things had gone back to normal. But Sun uh, had been thinking there might be room for a fifth member on the group, uh, at least unofficially. Like he liked the sound of Team Sin. Sun raised his eyebrows uh, at Sage and Neptune. Sage just, just shook his head, but Neptune embraced Sun. You could always count on Neptune. Okay, you're my best friend again, Sun whispered. Uh, <laughs> it's not like friendship is magic or anything, Baka. <laughs> no, he could always count on Team Sin. Uh, it was going to be back. Uh, it was good to be back, and he wasn't planning on leaving them ever again. Not for too long, anyway. Oh, thank God, my brain was about to melt. Looks like you, you added that. <laughs> Gotta get into Aussie mode. <laughs> Hang on, guys, I'm switching into Aussie mode. Looks like you and your team had a heartwarming moment back there, Velvet said as they walked through the streets of Vacuo. Sun was letting her lead the way. She was really getting to know the city. Yeah, we finally aired out our problems, which was long overdue. Thanks for letting them tag along. He glanced behind them at Scarlet, Sage, and Neptune. Thanks for letting me tag along, Velvet said. Some looked around the marketplace as they passed through it. Seems like everything, uh, everyone's in a good mood. People certainly seem friendlier. 
Velvet said. Here and back on campus, the vacuum has really come around. Right now, Sun had the most recognizable face in the city of Vacuo. Everywhere he and Velvet went, they were greeted enthusiastically by their fellow citizens, many of whom had been fighting alongside them only a week before. Who doesn't like to win? Vacuo hasn't done anything like that in, like, a hundred years. And it helped make it po and we helped make it possible. Shade Academy hadn't been this popular since, well, ever, and this trust of the outsider students had disappeared practically overnight. They had come to realize that the refugees weren't the weakest students from Beacon and Haven, the ones who ran away. They were the ones strong enough to survive the battle, smart enough to know when to retreat, and brave enough to fight for their new home. If you fought for Vacuo, you belong there. It was that simple. After they had walked for a while through the twisty streets, Velvet stopped. Here it is. She sounded mildly surprised that she had found it. Sun looked up. The dojo was exactly the same as it was. Maybe a little smaller, colors faded by the sun. Maybe it only seemed larger than life and more vibrant in his memories. How long did you live here? Velvet asked. Not long. A few years. Long enough for it to be home, she said. Sun raised his hand to knock on the door. He hesitated. Velvet knocked for him. And when he looked at her in shock, she smiled and stepped back. Sun took a deep breath and waited. I'm here, Velvet said. The door opened and his cousin Star appeared. She stared at him for a moment. Hey, cuz. I'm back. She slammed the door in his face. Sun blinked. His face got red. Sun, Velvet said. It's okay. Oh, that was you. It's okay. I deserve that. The door opened. Yes, you did. But I was just kidding. Sun's cousin grabbed him into a hug and rubbed his hair the way he hated the way he'd always hated. I deserve worse. I should have told you I was going. Oh, son, I always knew where you were going. Somewhere. No matter how much I wanted you to stay. She held him at arm's length. I only wanted you to say you would be back one day. I know you needed, uh, needed me to help out. She laughed. <laughs> Not really. I mean, it's nice and all. We could use you now, too, since your little pirate broadcast... We've had a lot more people interested in combat training than ever before. And if they knew you were here, that'd be good for business. But I want you around because I love you, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Well, I'm still sorry. She rolled her eyes, then she turned to Velvet. There's plenty of time for recriminations and apologies. Who's this? Another one of the heroes of Vacuo? Is that what they're calling us now? Velvet blushed. Star, this is Velvet. Velvet, this is my cousin Star. A gust of wind ruffled Velvet's ears and pushed against their backs. Star looked up. Wind's picking up. Get inside quickly and I'll make us some cactus tea. Looks like there's a storm coming. Sun glanced up as they passed the threshold. He didn't see anything, but his cousin had always been had an uncanny sense for the weather. She, <laughs> The wind blew and she said the wind was blowing. That's so special. Now, what have you been up to since you went to Haven? Star asked. That's a long story. Well, you have anywhere better yeah. Well, you have anywhere better to be right now? Sun looked at his cousin in velvet. I can't think of one. Um, do you know those guys? Star had been about to, to close the door, but she was peering suspiciously at the street. Oh, right. Sorry, I missed that line. He went to the door and opened it wider. Neptune waved at him. Scarlet bowed. Sage gave a dorky salute. They're with me. They're kind of my family, too. Mind if I invite them in? I think you better, Star said. Okay, but don't listen to a thing they say. She put a hand on her hip. Something tells me I'm going to like them. They're idiots, but they grow on you. Sun beckoned them in and closed the door behind him. He watched his friends and his cousin introduce themselves and start chatting about the recent battle, the dojo, and Sun himself. He smiled. Now he was home. And that's it! Jesus Christ, like... Wait, wait. Remember that entire subplot about his cousin that was brought up, like, in Chapter 3 and then never touched upon? Like, I don't... Yeah. What was Sun's journey here? What did he learn? What was that? I don't um, understand. Like, I'm trying to un unravel the exact like what they're trying to say about this 
Because, like, honestly, throughout this entire book, he just kept doing his normal thing, and it got him into trouble, but it also helped solve the situation. So I'm not entirely sure what we're supposed to learn from Sun's journey here. Uh, we're supposed to learn that we both got better at voice acting, and, uh, we have fans, so. Fair. Love y'all. Well, I love- Sage gave a do dorky salute. That's more character, uh, for him than the rest of the entire book. Jesus Christ, you are not wrong. Sage got nothing in this book. Literally, He's the quiet one. Literally, one-off characters from the Vacuo tournament, from the Vital tournament, got more development than Sage. About the author. I don't care. Uh, turn the page for a sneak peek from Storm Warning. An all-new story from Rooster Teeth hit show Genlock. Who's writing it? Melissa Scott. Okay, well, it has Cammy on the front. Which, good on them. Uh, but it looks like a brick to read. So, you know. No. So, folks, there you have it. Ruby Before the Dawn. What do you guys think? No, I actually think this is actively impairing my ability to write. It's like infecting. Like, like I've noticed like writing like I'm like, no! You know what I think it is? It feels very passive. It is very passive. Like I don't like when people say active voice, passive voice, I, I don't I'm not a huge believer in that kind of thing. I just do whatever feels natural and make it sound the right mood. But this just never felt intense. Oh yeah, no, it never did. It never felt like anything was actually like happening properly. Like it's weird because like I'm writing something very similar in in tone, but I shouldn't be. This is an action book. The book the story that I'm writing right now is literally about a guy that, that accidentally becomes a merchant. Like like it's about him and like building up a reputation around a country. Like that's that's really about him. It's about, you know, it's a, it's a quiet little story that has, like, it has highs. It has little action moments in there every once in a while. And one or two bigger action moments occasionally, because I'm, I'm an action writer by nature. But it's not an action piece, so it's a much more relaxed and more or more chill storyline that's focused on, on a few little characters and world building and that kind of... This is an action piece. This is a story about fighters, and none of it is working. It, like the, the more glad I didn't waste money on it. <laughs> but you know what you can waste money on? Uh uh Patreon. Yeah. For, for one dollar or right more, you get access to Team Frostbite Discord server where me and Molly are there as well as regular uh uh Unfortunately I am there. Fortunately Raymond is there. <laughs> uh you you will see how very opinionated Molly is. <laughs> Yes. I can I can make a chat entertaining just for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. yeah, please consider donating. I would love to have you guys on board. Uh, just like anime I get none art. of this. Holy so, shit. Uh... Velvet. In the end, this book didn't even matter. Calling it now. Uh, Star is the maiden. Also, Ray, how much do you want to burn this? Uh, how much do you want to burn the book live? Well, how much was the book? It was like. How much was the book? Was it like 20 bucks? Ruby Before the Dawn. Shopping. It was 10 bucks. I I do like if I I really really like the chemistry between Team Coffee. Right. Uh How much I would I I feel like burning books is sacrilegious. I'm also, like, a, a dead completionist. I don't know. How much would you say to burn a book, Molly? Um, well, I, I don't have room for books, so if you gave me any amount of money, I would do it. But preferably enough money to get me better recording equipment for my guitar. I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that anime as art. Uh... I'll heavily consider that in the future. Maybe we'll wait. To, like, I wonder if there's going to be like a trilogy of books. Well, this feels pretty rounded out for the vacuo subplot. Um, 
there's no real lingering mysteries aside from Bertolite going to hunt down Carmine, but even that feels like a kind of a closed case. So, like... It's you go. What? What were you saying? No, but I want. I want to. I want to actually give some positives here. I uh, love Velvet, um, even though she's like a very flat character. Well, her sub she does her, add some. Spice. Her entire plot she has was some dropped. Life to it, and so does Sun. Her entire plot was dropped. Like, remember, like the whole it's, subplot it's about her shame. father. Like, like we... yeah, it's a shame, but she is a good lead. Yeah, I, I love Velvet. I, I think she's actually... It's weird how... She, I, I loved her because she had like the best aesthetic in the show, at least as like the cute bunny girl. Like, like that, that was immediately like, oh yeah, you're above the others. But then we actually learn more about her, and she's an interesting character with an actual personality actually doing things. They're saying she was boring. I don't know. I mean... She gave me something, her and Coco and Yatsu. Like, I don't really care about about Fox, but the others. I, I found Fox was actually way better in the other book. You might want to go back and read you might be tempted to go back and read that. It, it, it I think the, the other book was stronger overall. This one I am more weaker. tempted to punch a hole in my wall than I am to go back and read the other book. I mean I thought it was actually decent I thought it was at least as good as volume four, which was it wasn't the greatest Ruby volume, but it was certainly a st stronger. Um, I don't rank Ruby by volumes or by episodes. I rank them by specific moments and episodes that stuck out in my mind. That's fair. Yeah, but I think Velvet has a lot going for her that could be really... There's a lot that could have been done in this that wasn't action-based. I feel like they're so... Ruby is not a series that translates well into novels. The, the 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 type of stories you need to write for Ruby need to be much more focused on like the intrigue aspect of the show, where you're trying to figure things out. And that's not really present in the show, I know, but there has always been sort of like the the the, the lingering mystery of things going on in the background. Focusing on that and characters trying to unravel things is the more interesting aspect. Having these big climactic fights doesn't really work in the setting when it comes yeah. to the writing. Also, um, the parts I really... There was a lot of, like, drama abort, abort mission, like, where they're trying to do something that's like, could be really kind of good and a little bit dark and give tension and they back out because it, it was like they're afraid of it like i want to go more into yatsu ashi's like traumatic whatever or velvet's backstory or whatever coco has going on it, it's uh coco and yatsu hashi got the uh, that explored in the last book to some degree huh. coco not so much yatsu hashi we got basically everything we needed to know about the man that's why i really like yatsu hashi as a character I think genuinely, I there's a, there's a there's a lot to work with there for him. He and Velvet have a cute relationship. Yes, it is. It's very cute. Uh, I really like how it kind of ties into his uh, the fact that he was just so guilty over the fact he almost got his little sister killed. Like you can easily draw the lines there. Uh, yeah. Fox got way more ex exploration in the last book too, because it was all about him basically, um, and like leading the team or like leading the team through the vacuum and waste that kind of stuff. But overall, um, I've heard of Arc Knights. There's some cute, fluffy characters in that. Floof loves. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm. This is definitely not as strong as the last book. Uh, it had more holes in it for the plot. The lore is just Swiss cheese at this point. Um, I like Swiss cheese. Swiss cheese is good, but it's not good for a story. Makes me no, want to eat not. the book instead of actually reading it. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I'm going to head off because I need food. Oh, my God. I need me food. Me too. So, yes. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you had a wonderful time. Me and Molly loved doing this for you guys. We hated the book, but well, this is true. We, we were ambivalent towards the book, I think. Really? I, I'm not really hating towards this thing. I, I'm just kind of like... It's more about... It's more about being being entertainment for you guys and having fun, doing voices. Um, that's what that's what it is really about, and having fun with my buddy Raymond. 
Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm all here to have fun with you guys and with Molly. This is just, this is the blast to do, even though it's exhausting. So thank you all so much for joining us. And we'll catch you all on the flip side. Bye.